All right, let's do a show. Okay. You hear that? That's that's the show starting. Wow. Feels good, right? Feels kind of pro, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is Hollywood Anonymous. I am Brian Irwin. And I'm John Huck. Across from us is Mr. Court McCowan. Yes. Hi, guys. Uh, comedian, actor... I mean, you might do more things than that. Golfer just came yeah, from the well, golf course. Clear, yeah. Avid golfer, he's just a golf dress lover. Yeah, yeah. Golf I was going to say when you walked in, I'm like, man, it looks like you just played golf, and I'm like, I bet he just played golf. I just played golf. Did just you know right, right, right over here, right by you, in, uh, at the Rose Bowl. Oh, at Brookside. Oh, nice. Look yeah. at that. Are you a big time golfer? I'm guessing. I do. I play. I play two, three times a week. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's nice. But that's, I mean, you know, it's like kind of everybody has their thing. You know, like people ride bikes or they go to the gym or whatever. You know, I mean, I play golf. I walk. I carry my bag. I'm not like a, you know, I'm like like yeah. a, a tulip and you know, get in a cart all the time. No, you 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 do it. For, part of why you do it is the exercise. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I've caddied on the PGA Tour. I caddied oh, wow. on the Champions Tour this year. So I mean, it's um, it's my. It's like I grew up doing it. It's what I love to do. Who did, who have you caddied for? I caddied for a guy named Jesper Parnovic, who's a Swedish okay. uh, Swedish golfer. Cool. Yeah, three time three time Ryder Cupper, um, won like nine, ten times on tour. Wow. His uh, his nanny married Tiger Woods, his, and that's his his nanny. Oh, is this the one, is the one that uh, threw the yeah. golf club through his? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, um, his nanny was uh, Elian. Yeah. Oh wow, Jesus! Yeah. See, small world, John. Huck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super small world that I'm nowhere near. <laughs> I have a more important question. What's it like to have that kind of time on your hands? Do tell. Me. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. like porn to me. Well, what it is? Time. Yeah, because you have free children. Yeah. You have children. Free time. What you have children. Like? You have a wife. You have those things that I have no no <laughs> idea what those things are about. I've heard about those things, and for everything it's, I've heard, it's like a horror I'm, movie. Yeah, everything I've heard, I'm doing just fine playing golf two, three times a week. I got it okay. Most people don't. Well, no, yeah, I got it lucky. I, yeah, you do. I, I don't yeah. have any kids, and I just don't have any money, so I can't. I can't play golf three times a week unless it's I'm not going. that expensive. It's a lot cheaper than kids. Well, it really, it's a you lot. Have to have the time though. buying I mean, you a have house to be okay and burning couple, it down is cheaper than things, kids, right? You have to be okay with getting up early sometimes. Yep, I right? get up at five fifteen. Yeah, oh, I can get up early. That's not a big deal. Yeah. And then you just got to have a couple hours on your hand on your uh, of time on your hand where you're not going to panic because you just you just got to take your time and go golfing. That's the beauty of golfing. It's like well, know, I mean, you think about it. I get up at five fifteen. I drive over here. I'm done at eleven fifteen. So what, by, at the time, most comedians are waking up. Yeah. Uh, I'm done. I'm done playing. Now I've, I've been up for a few hours. I've you had some exercise. exercise. I, feel, you know, I feel good. You know, it's like nothing really happens in this shithole of a town before noon. No, do that's you, uh, why. You go to bed early? Huh? Do you have to go to bed early on no, your golf I days? Or you no, just, you I, was, care? I was up till almost one last night. That's crazy. I started this thing called meditation. I started this Vedic meditation like eight years ago, and I'm fine with three, four hours sleep a night. Well, I define med- what this is. So what does this do? I meditate half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the afternoon. No and this what, what shuts the body down? It so shuts it, it, it down. It, tre- it treats it like rest? Like about a three-hour nap. So yeah, so I get that right when I wake up, I do this meditation. And even if you're a little tired, it gives you this like tons of energy that just takes you takes you into the morning. And then around three, four o'clock, I do it again, and it just, and it, and it's just, it's better than a nap. Is oh, really I, I, a half hour, huh? John well, normally just drinks and then falls asleep. Yeah. No, yeah. no, but I mean, well, you've done that in the afternoon. I've done oh, sure, I've done that in the afternoon. Yeah. I've done that in the morning, <laughs> but but I also started doing. I, I read a book uh, called Eight Minute Meditation that a, a friend of mine, his coworker, turned me on to. So I read that and then was doing that, and like the most I've ever meditated for, I think, is probably twenty minutes at a time, and that was. If that was like too long almost. But. Well, see, what's weird is, is like this guy I learned from, I learned from this guy, um, and he, he's like this neuropsychologist, you know, in addition to being a meditation guy. And he, they did these studies where they found that when you're like, your brain is, your brain isn't a muscle, your brain are, is neurons. So they're fights, it's firing all the time. So every time you move your hand, move your arm, anything, even in, even in sleep, you have REM sleep, you have all those different things where your brain is actually not shut down. Your brain only shuts down for a few hours a night. And that's when you get the deep sleep and the deep rest. Right. So when you do Vedic meditation, as you, as, as you get further and further along, you actually shut your brain down. And your brain actually goes completely at rest. 
and it releases stress and it does all these other things and it actually your body rests more during meditation than it does during a nap so you you know a 30 minute meditation is equal to or better than a three three and a half hour nap wow so that's the thing i don't take naps this is either, a but... science podcast right it's all <laughs> yes. about science yeah <laughs> I just want to know how does one go about shutting shutting off the world in order to even begin to meditate, which is why I've never done it because I cannot shut my brain down. You do what's called a mantra, and they have these things called mantras. And what it is is, let's say it's um, shreem. You know, it's some it's an in, in Indian word, um, dot not feather, and it's an Indian word. And what it is is it it doesn't have any meaning, and they call it mantras like a mind vehicle. And so what you do is, is you, you close your eyes, you sit down, and you don't sit in the cross-legged position in the middle of the room. You sit with your back supported. You're very comfortable. And um, you start, you close your eyes, and you just very effortlessly try to repeat that mantra over and over in your head. And after a period of time, I mean, thoughts will come in. Thoughts always come in. Like, you have to you know, kind of close the door and say, no, no, thank you. No, but what you do is the, exactly the opposite, is you let the thoughts come in, and then you just let them complete themselves, and you go back to your mantra. And the best way it was described to me was it's like going to a party with your best friend. Your best friend's your mantra. You're not going to ignore everybody else at the party, but you really want to spend time with your friend. So what you'll do is you'll let the other people have their conversations, and then you just go back to the mantra. And eventually what happens is you're so relax and your 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 mind has calmed down so much you forget to do your mantra and nothing comes in and your mind it's just this i can't even describe how great it feels but you're conscious and aware of it and it lasts for the the longer you do it the quicker you get there and the longer it lasts okay how do you get yourself out of it or do you just you literally are you're you're conscious so you just say all right i'm done yeah i know i kind of after you've done i've done it for so long now that i kind of know when half an hour is up i literally can like look down at my watch or look down at the thing and go, wow, it's like been 29 minutes or it's been 31 minutes, almost to the exact moment every yeah. single time now. Or you can set a timer, right? I mean, yeah. that's what you do at yeah. first. To An egg kind timer, of, one of the egg ones? An egg well, they, egg actually, they, actually tell you, they actually tell you not to do that in the beginning, oh, but really? later on it's fine to do it because oh. they want you to get used to that time frame. Okay. There you go. Were you always this kind of guy, like a meditation mantra oh, kind of guy? Oh, hell no. Hell okay. no. What I kind of guy a, were you? Where are you from originally? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Okay. Oh, no, I was not that kind of guy. I was the kind of guy that would um, do two bong hits before I walked my dog. All right. Yeah. You know, that was the kind of guy I was. Now, you're an Oklahoma kid. Um, how long did you live in Oklahoma before you bailed? <laughs> I was there until I was, um, I moved here when I was 20. 20. Okay. So you were, you, were, you know, a, a good portion of your life was yeah. spent in Oklahoma. Yeah. And what was that? like growing up a lot of people have perceptions of oklahoma right? yeah they're I mean, probably they, pretty close oh, what, really? what's your perception of oklahoma I, that's I, think what I, a, I think a lot of people think they're a tad bit of hickish and a little bit of racist and uh, a little uh, bit of cowboy lo- lo- love their guns yeah I, i'm gonna say not as hickish much more racist um they do love their guns and um it's not really hickish as much as I mean everywhere has their hickish places right. you know yeah, I mean even California, California does. yeah yeah, oh, yeah Jesus, I mean yeah. Um, but I don't think of it as that hickish as much as it was you know it's like it's just like fifteen years earlier you know? yeah <laughs> it's yeah. just fifteen years earlier except now with the internet you know when I was growing up it was you know it was earlier. But now that there's the internet and everything, I don't think there's any place that's really left in the dark anymore. No, unless you do it by choice, of course. Yeah, but I don't think there really is. I think everybody, there's, you know, there's J. Crew, Starbucks, there's, you know, all the shit stores that are in every place now. Yeah. And I don't think that they're, they are really, um, they're kind of in the dark. But they do, are, they're still in denial. I mean, they're, they're definitely a, a Fox News, that's a Fox News state. Yeah. You know, I mean, they hire a black senator an ex football player, of course. Now you can't yeah. just be a black senator. No, you can't just be a black guy. You've had to have played a sport. Husker, right? You yeah. had to have played at Oklahoma University. Oh, no, sorry, you got a torn Husker. Sorry, that's, that's Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. But um, I just became a Midwestern ignorant, <laughs> there you and go. I'm from the Midwest. Um, but there, but it's not that. It's not that bad. And I will say, the nicest people in the world. They really, really are. I mean, I'm white, so it makes it easier. But I mean, right. they really are nice, nice, nice people. A little, you know. I have like one cousin. That's like very like kind of hickish or kind of like set back, and he just bugs the shit out of me. Man. We were, John and I were talking about that we before we started because like John's from Illinois, I'm from Wisconsin, and, and, and we, that's the problem I think from the Midwest where we come from. The nicest people you're ever going to meet, 
definitely the nicest people you're going to meet. And then they will just spew some sort of ignorant racist stuff or just something so stupid. And you're like, seriously, you do know what, 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 yeah, what, what year de- it is, yeah, you, where we're at, where, where you live in society. It's uh, now Milwaukee is very segregated. And it's, it, isn't and it, it the it most segregated me. city in America? Yeah, it sickens me when I go back right. home because I, I'm well, just, I'm, it's sorry. okay. It's all right. John does it more than you. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm but the fuck out of yeah, uh, it. Yeah. It bums me out because I want to be able to go back to where I grew up and, and be excited about going back. And then yeah. just, sometimes I go back and I'm just shaking my head the whole time I'm there going, come on guys, catch up. It's catch weird, up. man. Like I have a cousin that every time I go home for Christmas or the holidays, it's like you know he always he always says the same shit so how's it out there in hollywood you know like like i'm running yeah. around with like your like pants it's just, doll, yeah yeah it's just like everybody <laughs> we're all the movie stars we all eat lunch together and, yeah. and everybody and it's like you know i haven't done a film in like 10 years why don't you back the fuck <laughs> off you know and he's a DJ, and I use that in air quotes because, like, he, he uses plays a computer. He, yeah, he uses. I don't think he uses a computer. I think he uses like cassettes. You know, he has like a dual cassette. <laughs> player. And, and, Speaking and, of that, Columbia House just went bankrupt. Yeah, I didn't you, know that they even still exists. Oh, because shit, me? Cord's cousin didn't pay his fucking right. yeah. ten tapes for a penny. Yeah. I had no idea that was even still available. Oh well, my now, God. now we know who is still buying them. Yeah, yeah I mean, this guy, hilarious. like, he was like, you know, he plays weddings, and you know, and he's like, he really gets jiggy. I don't know, you know. Yeah. And I just, I feel... He's a legend you, in his own mind. Yeah, so when weird. did you decide that uh, Oklahoma was not where you're going to hang the hat for the rest of your life? Well, I have one of those great, like, Hollywood stories. Like, that, like the real, like, crazy Hollywood thing. Like, I actually came out here. Um, I came out here for a vacation. I had a buddy who was, uh, who was a stand-in on a TV show. But he'd been telling me that he was, you know, in, he was living in Hollywood and, you know, he came back. I was going to school in Stillwater at Oklahoma State. And uh, he came, he's like, you know, telling us all these stories. And of course, this is like late night. And this is, now you got to understand, this is 1981. No, no, 1984. 1984. And this is like, you know, just blow everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, you're up till six in the morning and it's like, yeah, you know, you're starting businesses together. <laughs> yeah, and, you're going to save the yeah, world. Yeah, you're just doing it all. <laughs> you know, you're doing everything. The Every, next day, you're like, what the fuck er, was yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> everybody's your best friend. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's the best buddies. And I was with this guy, you know, and I knew him a little bit. I didn't know him really well, but he was like, you know, listen, if you ever want to come out to L.A., man, you can stay with me, man. You'll have a great time. He got the invite. Yeah, yeah. Like always, which is the thing thinks. that he probably invited a lot of people, and then maybe you were the one that showed up, and he was like, holy shit. Well, no, I, well, I called him, and I said, listen, Larry, I, I, I appreciate that, you know, I'm thinking about, like, taking a little vacay. And, uh, and at the time I was, um, I was a mess, man. I mean, I was, I was doing a lot of drugs and I was on probation at school. It wasn't going well, you know, it was not going well. It was time to go. Yeah. But I was, <laughs> but I was studying, like I had done theater when I was younger. I was in radio and television. I was a, I was a, a disc jockey at the, the college station. Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, kind of working at all these different things in that kind of field, but there's really no market in Oklahoma for this. No, no. <laughs> but at the time, I was so, you know, I was 20 years old. I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. And I ended up, um, I called Larry and I said, I'm going to come out for, I'm going to come out for 10 days, man. I need to get, I need to get the fuck out of here. And he's like, yeah, man, come on out, come on out. And so I literally got on America West and this is back when, you know, way before TSA. And I, you literally would write a check on the plane. Like you would sit down oh, on the plane yeah. and you would go, oh yeah, they come by with a little thing. They go, like a uh, train conductor almost. Yeah. Like and, you're they're like, and they're like, yeah, yours, uh, you know, because it was all the same price. It was like $100, I think it was. Okay. $100 for a one-way <laughs> ticket from Tulsa to, to LA. And I came out, it was the Summer Olympics, the 84 Summer Olympics. Yeah. So I was coming out. Nice. How did you even get out here? Yeah. I mean, this place crowded as shit. shit. Well, because a lot of people from Tulsa aren't coming to the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> that, that flight was not yeah, under yeah, control. Yeah, Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're of, kicking uh, back with now, a whole roll to yourself. Were on there that people one. holding chickens in some of the rows and <laughs> yeah, stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of a lot cowboy of hats. <laughs> um, but and then I, what I did was, is you know, I was going out to see Larry, so I had a, you know, I had a buttload of shit on me. So right. I am partying my balls off all the way. And America West was free drinks, so I party 
like a <laughs> free like drinks, a, coke in the bathroom, yeah, like you yeah, didn't like get a, searched. A rock star, you know, on this plane going out there, and you could smoke back then on planes too. Oh my God! So we're all standing in the back. These all, are the glory days, people. Yeah, we're all standing in the back of the plane, smoking cigarettes, doing lines, <laughs> drinking. You know, it's just insane. It's you know, the boogie nights flight, and it's only like three hours, and I'm shit faced, man. And I get off the plane. There's Larry. He's like, hey, you know, we fucking we go back. He lived on Laurel Avenue. Right above the Laugh Factory. Oh, nice. And so we we go back to his place. We stay up till one or whatever. And he goes, hey, listen, man, I can't. I got to go to sleep. I'm working tomorrow. Do you want to work? Do you want to work as an extra tomorrow? L- literally that quick. You've, you've been you got off the plane. You parted till one. And he goes, hey, I got to go to bed. Do you want to work tomorrow as a background guy? Yeah. Do you want to work as an extra? Uh, and this on your is, vacation, just so we're clear. This yeah. was not moving to town yet. No, no, no. This was on vacation. But I was like, he, I go, dude, man, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tight right now i mean like i'm messed up and he he, because we had to get up at six in the morning we had to leave at six in the morning and he was working all the way out in woodland hills and i was like oh shit man i go he goes it's a it pays a hundred bucks i'm like oh fuck i'll I'll wake up i'll I'll wake up i mean that was like a thousand dollars at that time and um and so i was like yeah man no problem no problem and now you gotta understand this is july in Woodland Hills. So it's about 142 <laughs> degrees outside. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the movie business. I didn't know anything about it. So my thoughts were, you know, he's like, you're going to be in this party scene. So you got to wear kind of, you got to dress like, you know, kind of like, like you're in a party. And this is, you know, this is the eighties. So it's, you know, you can imagine that yeah. the <laughs> shitty colors and, you know, I had feathered hair. My hair was down like all the way past my shoulders, yes. you know, so and, everybody was a Nagel painting, basically. Yes, everyone was a Nagel <laughs> painting. And um, and so we... No, not even Nagel yet. I don't... Was it Nagel? Yeah, maybe it was. Um, but it was just bad, man. It was just not not good looking. And um, and so I went to work with him the next day, and I had no idea what I was in for. And you, when you're an extra, you are literally treated like Fuck. a piece of dirt. Mm-hmm. So they, they have us outside, and we're shooting at this junior high school where they did Karate Kid. And we're doing this TV show. It's this TV show called Dreams. And it was John Stamos, Jamie Gertz, um, Ron Karabatz, all these different. It was kind of a cool. I love Jamie Gertz. I love the fact that you're remembering all this. Well, it's just, it's kind of one of those things where it's your first time. Yeah. Yeah. So you knew, you knew. And I, and I, and so to make the long story longer, um, so I get in there and we, and I'm sitting outside. It's like seven, seven in the morning. We're there. And I'm like, and I'm like, just I, it's everything I can do not to throw up. I'm actually did a couple of bumps on the way to the I place. Love it. I love it, dude. Just because I that's I, gonna even you out. It's yeah. gonna even me out. And I was just like, I was not feeling good. I didn't bring the extra gear I needed. The egg, to be the an chair, extra, the book, the, the, the chair, <laughs> the book, the the guitar. The, you know, every like you know, water. Um, yeah. those things that they don't really provide for you. Yeah. And um, and I was like, Jesus Christ, man! I'm sitting out there, and I was like, fuck. Well, luckily. About nine o'clock, we'd been out there about two hours, and I was kind of like, I needed that two hours so I didn't puke. But then it started getting hot, and I was like, oh shit, man, that's getting hot. Now I'm starting to really wig out, and I'm starting to sweat. Oh, and then they brought and that's his, not a good sweat, everybody. That no. Coke sweat is not. No. That is like the gnarliest sweat you can have. And scotch coming out on oh, top. Oh yeah, of it. just yeah. Bl- bl- I, bleeding yeah. booze. I was a scotch. Fortunately drinker. for that, uh, during the time you were probably just like every other extra there, smelling, sweating, smelling, and sweating, and sweating and yeah, and things. So yeah. you weren't sticking out. But also, just f- for anybody listening, like. There was no cell phones. No, like you were. You when you nothing. say you were there with nothing, that means like you're basically David Putty from Seinfeld staring at the back of a seat. You're like, oh, 100 percent, hundred percent, and nothing. That's, and and I didn't know anybody there. No, yeah, you're not. And the fact that I and this is union, so the fact that I'm actually at this thing, one of their friends didn't get a job, Ooh. so they fucking hate me already, <laughs> you know. And um, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I don't know what to fucking tell you, you know. Yeah. And so, but my buddy Larry's inside in the air conditioning, and I'm like, you mother. Fucker, fucking you know? Larry. <laughs> and so finally we get called in for the party scene and we're in this party scene. It's fun. You know, I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. And we're in, you know, they had one of those big yellow hoses that had the air conditioning yeah, that cooled the, off the, the whole <laughs> fucking room. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm just like standing in front of that thing. And now I got to have it. Now I got to have the air conditioning because I, you know, the thought of going back outside is not good because we shoot the scene. I'm like in front of the camera. It's like, I mean, I was in the whole thing and because Larry was like hooking me up, you know, like this visitor from out. What was Larry's part in it? What? Larry was a stand in. Oh, he was standing for So he for... was a stand in for, um, there was a guy named Kane DeVore who was on there. Okay. So it was a red, another kind of like light skin. Larry had red hair. He looked a lot like you without a beard. That's too bad, Larry. Yeah. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
And um, and so what ended up happening was is is they break and everybody you know they go okay that's we're done with background this scene outside. background out and I just fucking went over and I snuck over by that yellow snake. And I just sat in a director's chair, just right in front. It looked like that Max L tape commercial, <laughs> where the, the hair where the wears back. just blown back. And I had really long hair back then too, so it's I was all like, in the wind, baby. So, the, so a few minutes goes by, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like so happy. And then this guy comes and taps on my shoulder. He goes, "Hey, John, we need you in the scene." And I was like, "John," and I go, "No, I'm not John." He goes, "Oh," he goes, "Oh, um, all right. Well, who are you?" And I go, "I'm Court." And he goes, "What are you? Who, what are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm with my friend Larry." And he goes, "Well, wh-, you know." Kept going. He goes, "Well, you're not. You got to go outside." And I go, "Oh, I'm not going outside." And he goes, "Well, you can't be in here." And then he just walked away. And then I was like, "Fuck that guy." I like how you're just like, <laughs> and "I'm not doing that." Like yeah. you can say it all you want. Yeah, well, because most extras are afraid. Like I didn't give a shit. I because didn't know. Did, the, that's the that's the advantage you have is not knowing and not caring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I didn't care. And so I was sitting down there, and a couple people would keep coming up to me, going, "John." Because they didn't know. Because I, from the back, you couldn't tell me and Stamos apart. Our hair was the oh, same color, same they length, same you were everything. John Stamos. I didn't think they. Were, I just yeah. thought they were a guy named yeah. John. And so finally, the director of photography comes over to me and he goes, "Hey, listen." He goes, "You know, I could really use a guy that could be a photo double for John." He goes, "From the back, you guys, you cannot. You're the exact same size, the same height, wow. and you." And he goes, "I could really use a guy like that." And I was like, "Do I get to stay inside?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, you get to stay." Then inside. I'll do whatever you want. And he goes, "Great." I go, "That's great, man. I'm going to be here for ten days." He goes, "Ugh." He goes, "I need someone for ten weeks," and I was like, "Ugh." I go, "I don't." I go, "Can I let you know tomorrow?" And he goes, "Yeah." And he goes, "I go, but I can do it today, right?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, you can do it today." So what they did is this was a TV show where at the end of every show they would film a music video. This was the oh because they were in a band. They were in a band. Yes, they were in a I band. vaguely remember this show. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so what they would do is at the end of everything. But Stamos was this was his first series after General Hospital or I think it was General Hospital he was on. So he was really expensive. He was really highly paid. So they, they needed get someone. Him out of there. They wanted to get him out of there, <laughs> and they needed someone to film. They could shoot the long shots, and you know they didn't. You didn't have to tell. So I went back to the house with Larry, and we talked, and I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do it. So I went back the next day, and I said, I'm in, man. Put me in for 10 weeks. So I just, and that was it. I moved out. I moved that, out you never California. went back home. What, were you leaving anything behind at the time? Not really, right? I mean, Clothes. I had a shitty old Chrysler Cordova I left in the front yard. You know, it was terrible. I had mag <laughs> did wheels. Did you ever go back to get it? I did. I went, no, I went back. The car had gotten towed Okay. Um, because it had sat there. For, I, went, I stayed for five weeks. And then we had a hiatus, and then I I came back for a week, got all my shit, shit okay. came back out, and then uh, when I got back, my car was gone. My brother my brother lived like two doors down, didn't even look after me. He's like such a douche. Do you ever know what happened to that car? My brother said he saw it at an auction, like a year <laughs> and a half. Later. Why didn't your brother just go get the car for you? <laughs> Make a hundred bucks. I mean, it was probably worth. I think I paid eight hundred for okay. it, so it was like. I mean, it was, it, for you, it was like good riddance. It was good riddance, and I was making like I was making huge like because as a, as a photo double slash stand in at the time in Union, you were making a hundred. I think it was a hundred and forty, hundred and forty for eight hours, and then you were making, and then you made from ten to twelve was like time and a half yeah, you never were working and eight then, hours you're working yeah you're working day. 12 hours then 10 to 12 was was double yep. and then after that was what they call golden which was like ridiculous so i was making like i was making like 15 1600 a week which f- back then i mean yeah. it was crazy plus yeah. plus health health insurance plus you know all your benefits everything was taken care of all because of your goddamn hair all because i mean of my it really boiled down hair. to that that yeah. block of hair that was flowing from the from yeah. the ac unit and the guy and the guy that was uh the second ad on that was such a cool guy he's the one who brought me in to do teen wolf right after that he was the second ad this show got canceled and it was it got canceled we, after 13 episodes but 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 rightly so Oh, it was a piece I mean, of it shit. wasn't. All of a sudden, over here, <laughs> judgment. Yeah. But it's I mean, a great like, story like I say, the more I remember the the show, the more when you say the music video at the end, I remember even as a kid going, "Oh man, fuck that!" <laughs> but you know what was weird is like I got to see like that was like the coolest Hollywood thing because like Bill Bixby was one of the directors. He was like a regular director. Dude, Bill thing. Bixby. Yeah, Bill yeah. Bixby. That's that is David Banner from the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, yeah it was uh, Bixby was a director on all the time. Uh, John Peters and Peter Goober were the executive producers. Barbara Streisand's husband. So it was like this yeah, really a lot of Hollywood power. At yeah, the time. they they yeah. were huge at the time, and it was this big. Um, 
this big deal and it was CBS's big show and unfortunately it just didn't it didn't hit but I mean Lou Rawls was on the show Jesus. they had a sound stage set up at this where you know the where they did karate kid they took over the junior high school and they had in the gym was like a was the bar in another room I mean they had all these these permanent sets set up and they wow. had a, they had a sound uh a recording studio set up because they released a single on every on every one and I mean, I remember, I remember Lou Rawls like was there and Lou Rawls was huge, you know, yeah. even, even yeah. then he was huge and we got to go like hang and like watch Lou Rawls record. And it was kind of like at that time, I mean, I was 20, I think I turned 21 when I was there and it was like, I mean, Stamos would take us to the red onion, you know, which or, or, or whatever it was, TGI Fridays in the Valley. He lived in like Reseda. <laughs> And we'd all go out and we'd just bang girls. And it was like, it was just like. Did you just, so you just used the term, we all went out to TGI Fridays and, and bang, bang girls. girls. Yeah. It was the 80s. Like, that was, that TGI was Fridays was different back then, was, man. Dude, now I'm they t- cut you off after two beers. Yeah, I mean, it was like back then, it was like. I don't like think the, anybody went to TGI Fridays now to bang girls. If you said they'd be like, hey, bro. Get out. out. Okay. Oh, no. You're- TGI Fridays and the Red Onion had like night, they had like disc, like nightclubs. <laughs> so it was like a nightclub. So you didn't go there to eat. You went there to hang out in the bar yeah. and party with the girls. And I mean, there were hot girls. This was like the 80s. So you'd go there and it was like, boom. You and could- this is the first six months of your, this is like six months. This is off before Teen Wolf. Oh yeah. This okay. Been, yeah. But this is six months up. This is you taking a ten day vacation, and this yeah. is what what during that ten day vacation became a ten week stay. Yeah. Which turned into all this. Which turned into all this. Yeah. I mean, and I we got done. They canceled that show in like December. Where we, were you living? Did you stay living with your buddy, or did he ask you to kind of get out? I lived with my buddy. I lived with my buddy for a little bit, and then um, some people we met, um, some friends of his, lived on Hayworth, right behind what's now the Coffee Bean which back then was like a bank. This is on Sunset. This is Sunset and Hayworth. Okay. And so, so if you move into Hollywood, like literally right into Hollywood. Yeah, you're just like, <laughs> you get a spot. Oh, dude, I used to smoke pot with the hookers. The hookers used to hang out. The Director's Guild used to be. Sunset it was is, a different place, by the way. We should oh, clarify. Sunset oh, is not way what way it different, is now. Way different. It's like Broadway in New York. Like it, it's, oh, it's yeah, different no, this, now. This you know? was when Schwab's right. Drugstore was still, still there, which is now 9000 Sunset. Schwab's Drugstore was there. The, the Coconut Teaser which is now Hyde, yeah. was this little bitty joint, little bitty like rib and chicken joint uh, that was down on Crescent Heights that was like, I mean, the whole, where, where that 9,000, it was one level. It was just one level of like storefronts that wrapped around. And there was Schwab's Drugstore, there was this, there was this, and then there was this coconut teaser where you'd walk in and they had chicken on the, you know, roasting chicken. And you could buy tequila shots for uh, a quarter when you ordered. So they had this thing that looked like a, you know, a rack of like uh, of billiards, you know. So all the balls, you know, when you get your balls, but they had all the shot glasses in there. So you would go up, and when you ordered food, they'd say, "Do you want you want tequila?" You couldn't like take it to the table, but you you would order it, and they'd have limes in a glass there, and you would just you'd have to you'd drink, drink it there. You drink there, and we'd go there and order, do like five shots, and then go sit down, you know, and then eat. And then it eventually moved across the street, you know, but it was, um, yeah, I lived over on Hayworth for a long time. I lived with some other people that you had not met. So you were living with other people at the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, you were back then it was like roommates, but I think my rent was like 300. God. But but you were, so what what was it like for you coming from Oklahoma and just, or did you not care about living with strangers? That was never a big deal. You were already so like literally high on life, both literally. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd had high and high on life. Yeah, I was high a lot. So it didn't matter. Were you ever kind of like, what's up with these people? Or as long as somebody vowed for somebody, you were that guy. Well, no, what you would do is, is like, for example, like one of the, like I worked with, um, I met this one girl who was, uh, she was an extra. She worked, she, a lot of people were like in this extra kind of stand in. We were all actors, actresses trying, but see what I did too, is, is when I first got here, um, I, uh, I, you know, I I realized that's what I wanted to do. Like, okay, I want to be an actor, you know? And and in 84, it was like, it wasn't like now it wasn't like everybody was an actor. And so I went like, I enrolled in the, the school, this guy, John Lenn, who was like, uh, you know, Stanislavski. I mean, it was like method. It was like crazy, intense thing. And you would go in there with their guys that were working already that you knew from shit, you know. And you're like, and wow. John Lenn was like the fucking real deal. And, uh, <coughs> you know, he's like, his name is in the book for the actor studio. Like that kind of guy. Okay. And so he was like really cool. And you went into, you know, I started, started studying at night in his class. 
and then you started doing all these different jobs. You know, I mean, you would, you know, you so you meet people, and this one girl I met was she was actually Sybil Shepherd stand in on Moonlighting, <laughs> and she and she was like, you were yeah. in the stand in circle, is what you're saying? Yeah, I was saying. I was above the extras level. Yeah, now. I was yeah. in the stand in up, uh, but that's yeah, still I was, quick I was moving. Fucking up Wait, there. Was man. there a bar that was called Stand Ins, and that's where you yeah. guys all met? And we can yeah, start that it, bar. It, <laughs> we can start that bar. It was a good bar, and but it was but back then it was union money, so I mean it was like. You can you, make a decent living. You can make a very good living. You know, I mean, you were making, you know, you were making 70, you know, well, let's, I mean, I'd, I'd say you're probably making six, $7,000 a month. And back then, that's, I mean, that's double that's really, that now. Yeah, that's really Double good that money. now. Really, really good money. And, um, and rents were cheap, man. I mean, I think, yeah. I think our, we had a two bedroom apartment, beautiful apartment on Hayworth. It was a big apartment and it was two bedroom, two bath. Um, and I think we paid six. No, no. No, I don't think we even paid that. I think we paid like five fifty a month. Yeah, now that same apartment is five thousand fifty dollars yeah. a month. Well, but, but again, the, the Sunset Strip again, living over there and all that stuff it was just different back then, right? I mean, it, was it was different. Not... Yeah, I mean, there was nothing. There was not much going on. I mean, you had down there, you had Gazaris and you had the Rainbow, the Gazaris, Roxy. Yeah, you know, the Roxy was big because that's where Belushi was hanging out on top and on the rocks, you know, and all those places. I mean, he had died right before I'd gotten there, but that was still kind of like the the shit. That was where a lot of stuff was going on. There, I mean, Hollywood was different. I mean, it was really seedy. A Hollywood Boulevard was just oh, that was a, that was a, it was a knife fight. I yeah. mean, that was just that was just homeless people. So you didn't go there. No, no, was not, you learned no, that were, quick. Oh yeah, well, all the nightclubs back then, where everybody went out at night, all those were downtown. So everything, no yeah, everything. Wow, so downtown had like a, a oh a heartbeat. Down, downtown was jamming, man. Yeah, downtown was where all the clubs were. They were great big clubs, and and it was and it was like that. But I mean, you had, um, you know, you had. <laughs> What was what's the name of that place um, on Santa Monica right there the the pub um, Barney's 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 Beanery now you got to realize now too this is 1984 1985 and West Hollywood was not a city yet but there was Boys Town you know right. that was going on and Barney's Beanery was this old pub that was like for straight people that was right in the heart of Boys Town and they used to have a sign above the door. A sign that hung above the door and written on all the matches, no faggots allowed. Are you serious? Wow. So they used to have a big sign that hung above the door and on every matchbook was printed, no faggots allowed. Like you said, there's hicks everywhere. Yeah. Wow. Right in the heart. But if you had one of those matchbooks, that's got to be worth something. Yeah. but they... <laughs> That's how you're looking at this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I mean, it's just such a weird... That's crazy. You couldn't do that. I mean, imagine doing that in West Hollywood now. No faggots allowed. <laughs> well, they burn it down. I think the minute it turned into a city, they they put a kibosh on that. I'm surprised yeah. that it was that there. Survived that. It, it was there for a long time. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it was kind of that was a place. I mean, it was where there was like 150 different beers. It was it was a really cool place, you know. And it so was, you're saying variety saved them from being a holes. Yep, a variety of. Well, this was this is before it was Barney's, right? <laughs> no, it was oh, Barney's. This was, it was, wow, it's it always still, been Barney's. It's right? always been Barney's. Oh wow, you know, and and it was uh, it was a little bit more of a bit of more European. I mean, you know, there was there was a couple of different places. There was the Cat and Fiddle Pub, but the Cat and Fiddle Pub was on Laurel Canyon. Uh, underneath the Canyon Country store. Oh, wow. So that's where the Cat and Fiddle Pub was. So we used to walk, because we were get just trashed, <laughs> and we used to walk up Laurel Canyon, because it was only, what, a quarter mile? You walk up yeah. there, and we'd go to the Cat and Fiddle Pub, and that was the only place that had uh, bass ale on tap. So you'd go there, and you'd play darts, you'd drink till you're blind, and then you just walk back down Laurel Canyon to the house on Hayworth. <sighs> and that's where you'd go. And, I mean, there was Coach and Horses. There's a few of those places, but... For the most part, you know, everything the nightlife was downtown. It was downtown. You know, and, and, you know, Santa Monica was nothing. So were you, this whole time, were you like, were you were just loving life. You were like, oh, Hollywood is, is pretty sweet. This this gig's pretty easy. Or were you, or were you kind of, a, did you have a business mentality too of like, what's the next thing coming for me? Like, how did you approach living out here? Because it's, you, like you said, that's pretty crazy. You, you show up here, have a little bit of cocaine, next thing you know, you're in the business, which nobody has that, you know, exact story. Well, so. it's kind of weird is I had like five years. I, when I first got here from 1984 to 1989, 1990 it really was good like i didn't really have nothing nothing really slowed down i mean everything actually everything got better and better and better each and better. role was bigger and everything was well yeah because i started out like when i did that show dreams i was that was like great and then that show ended and i was like oh shit what next 
but I had money saved up because you didn't, you know, you just made so much money and your right. rent wasn't very much. So you'd have money saved up and then you were like the, you would, you knew something else was coming and then you would take little side jobs or you do something in between. So then like we got a call like to do this, do this show, you know, this guy that was a second AD called me and Larry up and he goes, Hey, I got this gig. He goes, I need two young guys that aren't fuck ups. Because most ex back then, at most extras, we were all fuck up. I mean, yeah. most of the people were fuck ups. They they really, you know, you they didn't know what was going on, you know. And I once I got that job, like I took it real seriously. You're like, talking I, about the first job, yeah. And I always did. Whenever I got on the set, I was like, I tried to learn what was going on because a stand in job is not easy. You have to, you, if you don't know what a stand in is, if your listeners don't know what it is, is basically, a, you know, a group comes in. You've directed stuff, so you know. But it's like a group comes in and they do a, you know, they do a walkthrough of the scene where they block it. And then the, the actors aren't going to stand there while they light it, which right. could take an hour, hour and a half. So they leave and the stand-ins basically walk and do exactly what the actors second do. Second team. Second team. Yeah. And so, you know, you're, when you're a second team, it's like a lot of second team guys, they're just fucking off all day long. They don't care. They know they're making good money. You know, they hear second team and they walk up and they're like, well, wh where do you want me to go? And there's, cause there's marks on the floor. They don't even know what the fuck they're doing. I was always paying attention. Wanted to know what was happening. You, you, you got yourself in with the crew. Yeah. If the crew likes you, you're yeah. good to go. And, and yeah. you got ADs and shit bringing you back for yeah. stuff. That says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's what happened is this AD calls us, calls me and Larry and he goes, Hey, listen, I got this gig. It's going to be like five weeks work and um you know we're gonna and i need you guys are gonna be in this thing a lot and i was like okay cool and it was teen wolf and so we got to be on this bath you needed two guys there was two guys that were not principal characters on that were on his basketball team on michael j fox's team because me and larry i'm in the whole fucking movie <laughs> you know i mean even imdb gives me credit for it you know and That's they didn't awesome. you know I mean, it was one of those things, and and that movie, I don't know, was it was super popular when it came out, right? Because it's still well. What happened like a was classic. Michael J. Fox did that movie. It was oh, the first, and then, then they shelved it. Then they shelved it until Back to the Future came out. And Michael J. Fox, they, his people tried to stop that movie from coming out because they were like, no, 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 no. They it was a good. It was it, they liked it. it oh, was, okay, it, it actually okay. Came out. It okay. came out pretty good. I yeah, mean, but but the, you're right. It came out. It was done before Back to the Future, but came out after. Yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious, because then there was like a Michael J. Fox party train going on at that yeah. point. He was such a nice guy, though, man. He was the yeah. coolest guy ever. Yeah, he was one of those guys. It's his first big movie. He bought his first new car. Because back then, man, um, you got to remember, Family Ties was kind of Meredith Baxter Bernie's show. It wasn't like the Michael J. Fox show He yet. slowly had become but the he, star on that show. But he did over slowly time, over time. Over the over seasons. Time, yeah. Well, especially after Back to the Future and Teen Wolf. He became the huge star okay, of the so show. Okay, kind so of, that's, that's what put, they put him in front. Okay. Wait, yeah. he was still doing Family Ties when he yeah. did Back to oh, the yeah. Future? Holy oh, yeah. Holy shit. Okay. He was doing everything back then. I mean, that's Smart. how Hollywood works. Somebody I mean, he gets did Back to the Future 2, I think. When he was like still doing family ties, he would do that at night and do family ties during the day, whatever or however that worked. Yeah, but I mean, he was such a nice guy. I mean, I mean, I worked on Family Ties the last, the second to the last episode of their their series, and I remember like he was such a fucking cool guy. I was working on a TV show on the back lot at Universal about oh seven eight months after Teen Wolf, and. I'm walking to the commissary and I was hearing this this horn honk and I turned and it's Michael in his he had this he'd gotten this like 280 ZX was his first car and he loved it because the radio was on the uh, steering, steering wheel. wheel it was one of the first <laughs> ones I had the radio that's control. awesome and we used to ride around in the school, in the parking lot outside the um, gymnasium we were doing basketball and smoke cigarettes and and dry and he would drive and you know it was really cool <laughs> so I got this honk on Universal and I turn around to Michael. And he goes, dude, you got to see. He was he was doing these, um, doing voice voiceover stuff for Back to the Future, and he took me in and gave me a little, showed me just a just a little bit of it. But he was wow. like such a nice guy, and he was like, you know. And then I remember I went and did Family Ties, and he was so cool. He's like, you know, can you come have dinner with uh, me and his wife? You know, because we were going to, you know, whatever. I think we rehearsed or shot or something. We had a rehearsal, then you had dinner, then we did the live taping. And I think he was like, but I couldn't do it because I had to do some blocking stuff. But he was, that's the kind of guy he was. Yeah. What just was, solid. what did you, what did you do in the ep episode? Were you just doing the stand in thing? No, I, you, no, this was when I, this is, at this time I'd been you, working. You, so, so that's so you that was my you, next question. So when did you actually go from just being like a, uh, a stand in or featured extra into actually 
well, starting I, to get acting gigs. Well, after I did Teen Wolf, I started um, I started doing this thing called Go Between Services, where I would deliver scripts and resume. It was it was it, it, long story. Messenger what it was. service. Messenger service, yeah. but it was before fax machines and emails and everything. So I hit every studio, every agent's office all the time. Here's a package. Here's my headshot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Here's your headshot. Exactly. Yeah. I got, almost got fired because I kept putting my headshot in the casting director for Cagney and Lacey. And this guy, Fuad, who was like the operator, you know, like the, the whatever you call him, the dispatcher, dispatcher, yeah. the dispatcher, Fuad, like, because we had CB radios, you know, <laughs> Fuad comes, he goes, you fucking idiot. They, <laughs> they, they are casting for pregnant woman. Why you put your fucking picture in that? You know, he goes, I fucking fire you, you piece of shit. You know? uh, and, uh, but, but you were trying, man. Yeah, I was trying all the time. And, um. Uh, and then I, but I put my, I headshot in with this lady named Yvette Bickoff, who was an agent at the time. She was on Sunset and she kept, one day she goes, she goes, where do I know you from? And she kept playing. I go, I don't know. And she goes, how about these 50 fucking headshots? <laughs> you, got me? you know? And I was like, oh, and she goes, are you in SAG? And I was like, no. She goes, when you get in SAG, you give me a call. I appreciate, I, I, I get your persistence. So long story short, I got into SAG. I did, was doing this show called George Burns Comedy Week. And uh, it was with it, George Burns. George Burns was like he would come in and do a green screen and do the intro for all of it. But, but would he, you actually around George Burns? We're yeah. gonna stop you for a second. Wait, you met obviously... you met George Burns? Oh, absolutely! Holy shit, dude! You, I you mean, do it, were you holy shit at the time, or were you kind of like whatever? Do you realize that you got to understand? Okay, this was the this was maybe the greatest show to ever work on because I was a stand in at the time. And it was called George Burns Comedy Week. It was produced by Steve Martin and Carl Gottlieb. Carl Gottlieb oh. wrote Jaws. Oh. So Carl, they, so every week was a different cast with a different director and a different setting. It was like, do you remember Amazing Stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was the comedy version of Amazing Stories. So they called it George Burns Comedy Week because every week would be like, one week would be the story about a millionaire who's going to give away a million dollars to whoever can make him laugh. You know, because he's never laughed his whole... The next one is about, you know, a, a, a spy thing, you know, or whatever. And the next one's about a small town, you know, uh, in the middle of nowhere that has, you know, that has a gold mine that nobody... You know, it's just, it's all comedy. But, I mean, I got to work with on this thing. This is, like, the list is just enormous. Like, Telly Savalas, Get, Elliot Gould. Come on! Uh, Don Rickles. Don, Get out of here! Don Knotts. Um, Danny Flagg. Um, Paul Reiser when he was young. Jack Guilford. Um, um, I mean, just... I, uh, God, I mean, the list. That's uh, uh, Harvey Corman, uh, wow. Carrie Fisher. Wow. Um, Steve Martin directed his first episode. And we had directors like John Landis. <laughs> and Steve Martin directed his first show on that. And, um, Phil, and then I got lucky... And that I worked really, really hard on this. Like, I really was like... So you never just fucked off and were like, I'm in never, Hollywood, this is awesome, no, but whatever. No. You always like... So you actually always appreciated what you I had. really appreciated what I had. And I was like... And I, and the, what I found through going to acting classes and stuff, because now I was like really into it. And I was studying hard. And I was getting better. And what I was learning was is that you could do... All these things you were doing in class were all fine. But that didn't teach you how to stand up and sit down in a chair on camera. <laughs> right. Because once you're on camera, it's like shit's different. And I was like, now I fucking know, motherfucker. I know what, <laughs> I know what to do. Like, you, like, I'll never be afraid of being in front of a camera now. But I'd always see people that get jobs, and it's like they look like idiots in front of the camera because the director probably got, no, no, you can't do that. Yeah, no, you got to move here. Like, like to walk up and, you know, say your line while you're hitting your mark without having to look down at your feet. And, you know, how to do all these things. So I was learning all this. And I, but I was always there. And then one day they just go, because you couldn't get into SAG unless you got a line. You had to get a line. What do they call There's a um, Taft Hartley. Taft Hartley, yeah. Taft Hartley. So you couldn't, get a, you couldn't get into the show, couldn't get into SAG unless you had a line in a SAG show. But you couldn't get a line in a SAG show unless you had a SAG card. It was like, you yeah. know. Catch 22. Catch 22. So one day I went to work and they go, uh, sorry, but you're not. You're not a stand-in today. I'm like, oh shit! Like, who backstabbed me and who fucked me and how did <laughs> yeah. I get fired? <laughs> and they took me outside. They had a trailer at Universal Backlot. There at first, they beat you up. They had a trailer <laughs> back there, you. and they fucking gave me a line in the show. Like, they, and it was Phil Alden Robinson because they liked you. Yeah. Again, I think I always say to people, if you want to work in this town, you ha you have to be liked. You cannot be an asshole. People work with people until they you, like. until you're until you're well known. Then you can be a complete ass asshole and just fail upwardly yeah, yeah. exactly so the rest of your which life. I'm sure you've seen us, your fair share of yeah it's like it's different and and I mean it was so nice because I, I did a scene with Martin Mull God. and uh, <laughs> and it was like it was a great thing and they were really cool 
And it was like, and I remember like Phil Robinson who wrote uh, Field of Dreams and directed that. He was the director and, and they were all like so nice to give me this thing. And then I went back to like the, like the next week and I go here, Yvette, I go, I'm in SAG. And she goes, okay. And she started sending me up on stuff. And then the first thing I got was Can't Buy Me Love. And then I got this great, you know, I got this movie that was nothing at the time. You know, it was nothing. No, it was called Boy Rents Girl. Patrick Dempsey was not really known. Yeah, he, you know. well, he. But he was the. I mean, he was what sold that movie, right? Like that's what people no. Were, no. Well, no. If, I, if I remember correctly, that that whole genre just took off. So it grabbed some of these types of movies that maybe had not planned on being as big a hits become hits because it was a genre of this style of movie that was being made at that time. Correct. Well, it was a little bit, and then we got. We really, like I said, we really got lucky because at this time we were a small budget film. I think it was like a three million dollar movie. It was tiny, you know, which was pretty small, and um, it was done by this company called Apollo Pictures. Was this guy? who's not even with us anymore. I think his name was Jerry Henshaw. And he basically did anything close to porn at the, you know, I mean, he was just not a reputable, right. reputable guy, but he was though. I mean, you know, he was just shady and uh, we did this small movie. And I mean, literally, I mean, Dennis Dugan was in it. I mean, he was like a huge director now, but Dennis Dugan played like Patrick Dempsey's father. There was like nobody you really knew, like nobody really known. And Patrick Dempsey, all he'd done for the most part, was he starred in a TV series called Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and um, wow, he, that couldn't have done well. It and it, oddly <clears throat> enough, it didn't, and it and it and it didn't do well. I got to work on the show, but it was, uh, but it, but the only person that was in it was Ray Walston. Mister Hand was in it, <laughs> of and, course, and then the uh, the science teacher. Oh, the 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 guy was in Better Off Dead too. Yeah, and and he was in it, and but it was still Amy Heckerling who wrote and did Fast Times, did the directed. Oh it. wow, yeah, and her husband Neil. Um, What's Neil's? It doesn't matter. You have an insane memory, by the way. Yeah. Um, but it was so it was like fun. But anyway, so we did this movie. And then after we did this movie, I remember we got called. Everyone, we we're going to have a party. And they called something. They go, we're going to have this big party. Come over to the house. We, we got a big surprise for you guys. Went to this big house for this party. And Mark Berg, who was the director, who was the co-producer on the show, who now is famous for like representing Charlie. He's Charlie Sheen's manager. Okay. He's done all the Saw movies and never given me a job. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> and uh, he like, I think he owns a fucking hockey team now. You're such a prick. Um, no, no, you're a nice guy, Mark. I love you. Please, please. I need something. Um, but anyway, they, we all went over there and they, and they had this guy there and this guy comes over and I, I remember these names just because at the time it was, this guy named, this guy's name was Chris Zarpas. And he worked for Touchstone, which was Disney's, uh, an arm of Disney. Their PG version. Their PG right. version of movies. And, and they go, we just bought your movie. So this was the first movie that Touchstone ever bought that they didn't make themselves. And they go, you're all going back to Arizona. We're going to reshoot some of this stuff. And we're going to release this. And we're going to call it Can't Buy Me Love. And we got this. And we did this. And we're all like, yeah. <laughs> and we're going to re- release it in 1,500 theaters. Wow. And we were the number one movie that summer for like four or five weeks in a row. That, that would have been cool, right? Is that, that's a, the kind of stuff, right? Dude, back then they used to release like four movies. A, a, right. I mean, that was <laughs> right. it. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was, I mean, I couldn't go anywhere. It was like I, everywhere I went was like, it was like, I remember going to the movies with this. I had a date. I went to the movies with this chick and Westwood and the, like the manager came over and like took me and he goes, dude, what would you like? You know? And he like had me go sit down and brought me popcorn. And like, I was like, wow. I so <laughs> got laid that night. Too. It was so good. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I have, I have two questions for you. One, I'm going to take a step back for just a second. Cause obviously you do do stand up comedy. So I'm curious that but you weren't, you, weren't doing stand up back then. No, 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 no. no, no. no. But I'm oh. curious. Um, did you, <clears throat> Not only is it exciting to be around the people that you name, like the Don Rickles or the Steve Martins or the George Burns, but did you actually pay attention to what they were doing? And, and were, did you ever find yourself learning from them? And did you, did you pull influences from those people as you go along? Or were you just like, oh, cool, there's those people. I'm fascinated by them. Or were you actually kind of always uh, a, a student? Well, I, was, I would think I was really was a student most of the time. I thought it was really, like... TV's oh, just going to come on here. Well, you got the, the NFL training camp going on, you know? <laughs> 
And you got it's got a mind of its own. You got another guy in a striped suit. Good thing, um, right. Good thing we're not getting paid for this. But, um, but no, you know what? I did. I did learn. I did try to learn. And especially, it, it was more. It was easier to kind of learn from the younger guys that were more my age because the older guys. They just kind of did it. I mean, it was were you like, fascinated by was how, fascinated how slick by they were at what I they was, did. I mean, like Don Rickles was one of my favorite people in the world. <sighs> yeah, like he used to do. I, I really got that motherfucker. I got him good. Like he used to. He used to really fuck with people, and in a in a loving way. But he would do stuff. I mean, he knew everybody's name. And I remember going, Don, how do you know everybody's name, man? On the crew, he goes, in case I get robbed, I want to know who to have arrested. You know, he used to say <laughs> shit like that. And then what he would always do is, is I was standing in for Rickles, and it was John Landis who was very mean. He was a very mean guy. He was just getting ready to go on trial for that. Yeah, the, this, the, oh, Twilight, the, Zone thing, yeah. the Twilight Zone. Movie. By the way, you stood in for John Stamos and Don Rickles and, <laughs> and Ellie Gould. I did a photo double with Ellie Gould where they 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 uh, had to glue hair on my chest. <laughs> Because they did a cutaway shot where it, it, basically I would I was laying down on a cot and I would and I would sit up and then he would just appear. They didn't want to cut. They wanted to literally look like he just appeared in the doorway. And and I had and I mean they literally I had to spend like three hours while they just they they glued this mop of shit on me because he was so fucking hairy man. Yeah. I mean that guy was like a grizzly bear. And um, and I was like I was like 21 with this just no hair on my chest. And they just glue this. Just looks like I just got this huge pussy all over my chest. <laughs> you didn't take it out that night and meet no, some ladies in Glendale. Yeah. Um, but Rickles used to always come up, and he would always go, "Hey, kid, hold this." He'd hit, pop my pop his script to my chest. Hold this. Professionals are going to work right now. <laughs> and he go, he go, let the professionals do this. You know. And, yeah. and he kept doing that. He goes, and he ca- always called me kid. So one night, uh, one of the last shots of the night, we had there was a penthouse magazine on set. And I was just fucking around, and, and he was he was doing a scene, you know. We we're in this thing, and I started tearing out these pages of these chicks with their legs spread. It's penthouse; it's not Playboy. And this right, is like right, right. And this is like you know lips. It was like disgusting, <laughs> and uh, in a good way. But um, so I started signing it with like to Don. Does this look familiar? Love like like Trina or something, you know? And I started taking these, and I just stick them in the script pages. You know, I just kept sticking them in the script. <laughs> And I just thought, hey, he'll get a kick out of this. You know, he'll get a laugh out of this. And then um, the next day, like 7.30 in the morning, I'm standing on set, you know, because we're getting ready for the first shot. And Rickles comes, where's the kid? Where's the kid? I got to talk to the kid. And he comes up to me and he goes, my wife helps me memorize my lines in bed at night. <laughs> he goes, you got me, kid. You got me. <laughs> and I thought that was like, he was such a cool guy, you know? But he was like, oh it, was, my it was one of those things where it was like, there were so many cool things, you know, that got to happen on that, you know? And, um, you know, that was one of, like, I got to say that it was probably the best time I ever, you know, even being that young, you know, you're working at Universal Studios, you know, you're on the back lot every day. And like, we're, ne- we're shooting next door to Amazing Stories where Steven Spielberg's doing his show. You know, you you have hopes, you have dreams. You're young enough that your career's not over. And the environment's all around you at all times, too. You actually feel like, okay, this is what Hollywood is oh, when dude, you see it in the movies. We're, we're throwing the football with Robert Redford on the back lot. Like we're, like we're playing, we're between sound stages. And Robert Redford was doing that movie. I think it was like Legal Eagles. We have Michelle Pfeiffer. Or, or Daryl Hannah. Daryl Hannah when she was hot. Um, <laughs> she's not She hot. listens to the show. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> But it you get was, a look of belief for just one second. No, yeah. don't worry about yeah, that's it. Trust right. me, don't it's worry a, about um, it. But, she, but like he was back there, and we'd be throwing the football, and he, like he'd walk out, and he'd be like, hey, hit me. You know, and you, you, you know, so you're tossing the ball with Redford. It was just a time when you know, Hollywood was – nothing was corporate. You know, and that's what, that's what I think really sucks, not just about Hollywood, but about this whole country, is that it's become so corporate – that there's nothing really independent anymore, you know? And, and back then everybody was, you know, Universal was its thing, you know? And then there was Fox and there was, you know, Warner Brothers, there was these studios and they kind of made these, they kind of made these great movies and they, you know, they did these things. Everybody worked, you know, if you went out and you would, you auditioned for a show and you did a good job, you fucking got the part, right? you know? And it was like, but now it's like, 
well, we're going to read you, but really we've got this kid that's on a reality show that's, that does YouTube that we really think would be much better in this so we can get some YouTube hits <clears throat> and some more Twitter followers for our fucking show. Yeah. It's like, go fuck yourself. Why don't you fucking hire quality people? You know, because there's so many quality people out there, and now it just doesn't make a fucking bit of difference. Well, quality doesn't equal a safe bet. They're but, trying but to But not anymore. Like, I think, that to your point, is that it used to. Like, quality was like, if you gave it's a changed. good performance... The, the entertainment you... business has changed drastically. I mean... It, drastically. Uh, drastically. However, you know, you, you, you can't give up. I mean, we all, we all fight the good fight, and you shouldn't give up. I mean, unless no. you're just done with it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's or a... Or if you suck. <laughs> if you're terrible at it, you should give up. You'll just never make any money. Well, That's probably a good idea. No, but I mean, yeah. it's just it's it is harder now. It really is hard to get your stuff through because you know I I, I can't tell you how many times when I'm trying to get a movie made, how they'll talk to me about like, well, who's in it and how many followers do they have, and it's like I want to cringe how does that point? How does and that... I want to vomit because I'm like that has nothing to do with this movie. Yeah, and that's the thing. But the, the one other side of that that's I think that's allowed some things is like you can go make a show now. And you can, you know, if you can, if you can do it, if you can find a way to get something, you know, get to make one, make two and show it to Netflix or Amazon or show it to somebody. If it's quality, they're going to fucking put it on. There's more platforms. I mean, look at It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Nobody knew these fucking guys. No. And, I'm, and I know that's one in a million deal. But I know that that's not the that's no, but not quality the norm. rises to the top. But when, I do when think, you do when you fire on all cylinders, it does find its way. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's a thing where they got there was nobody was known. And then they brought in Danny DeVito. And he kind of brought it over the top. But I don't think anybody, I, I don't think they had to have that to make it happen. But I think it was just a nice you know, thing they put on it. But if they didn't have eight Danny DeVitos and right. one guy. Right. You know, and, and that's kind of what's happening now. More and more you see that happening. And it's just, I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day and they go, oh, yeah, we're, they got this YouTube person. It's like, you, well, what do they do on YouTube? Oh, well, they do. And it's like, oh, fuck them. Yeah. You know, just because people have nothing better to do than follow some fucking putts on YouTube. It's like they're not doing anything. No. They're not doing anything interesting. There's a couple very talented people on YouTube, and I hope that they, they actually find a way to bridge the gap. But then there's all this other stuff that I just don't understand. I, I don't either. And the funny thing is, is, is all you people are buying into these guys. And the fact of the matter is you're buying into shit. And it ends up biting them in the ass anyway, because at the end of the day, it's like nobody really follows that shit. No, no and, you know? and what an executive can say is when if they give somebody some YouTuber a show and that show fails, it's like, well, this guy had a million followers, so blame this guy. His followers didn't no, no, come no. to the show. You're missing the point. It actually goes back to these arguments <clears throat> of sometimes like why do certain actors continue to get movies? It's because even though the movies are shit. It still makes us money back, and that's the thing. Is there's two different ways to make. You know, it's a yeah. product. At the end yeah, of the day, absolutely. So these this YouTube thing, um, it has been working. The the product is shit, but everybody that invested in it, guess what? They all got their money back and then some, and they'll continue to crank out the shit. The thing is, do you want to be known as the guy? Yeah, that cranks out shit, or do you actually want to make something that you want to make and take your chances? I mean, that's really the choice you have to make. So it's like seventy five percent of people would take the first. Oh, I'll be the just guy that cranks out money shit. Back. Yeah, yeah I think I just think I think there's going to be I think there's going to come a time where it is you start to look at the shows that do rise. You look at shows like Orange is the New Black. You look at House of Cards. You look at the now. I granted this is David Fincher. I mean, you've got yeah. some, you got Kevin some big, Spacey. Yeah, it's but like, I, I know that. But I mean, I'm still <laughs> saying that these these forums for this. You look at the different people that are in House of Cards. Not everybody's a known actor. Mm. Not I mean, you look at some of these shows. There there are some opportunities that are coming out there, and and I. I do like that 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 that's happening. I do think that um, I do think that we're going to see the end of network TV before long, and it's just going to be yeah. all game shows and <laughs> shit, <laughs> mm-hmm. which it pretty much is now for the most part. Local well, look, news. People say I don't know about that. I'm like I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you MTV. Yeah. Do you see a music video on the music television network? No. 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 That's what happens. People forget. It just eventually over time. They yeah. phase out whatever they want, and they're were. not they're not making the they're not making the decisions that a company like Netflix is making, where it's like, yeah, let's put this edgy show on. They're like, can't put that on, we'll get fired. Yeah, you know, and, so and they're I, just passing on things that are. But I going think on it, all, it all comes from. I think it all comes from the one base thing is is that you don't have creative people in those positions that make decisions anymore. They're all people that were in law school that rose through some kind of ranks. There's no creativity in there. I mean, you got to give Les Moonves credit. I mean, that guy, for whatever reason he puts, I mean, he at least has has had a creative mind. I mean, he at least has made some creative decisions. And I think you start looking at 
Like there are creative people out there. They just, they're not in the right position to do these things. Then you look at who runs, you know, who runs some of these network, the, the Netflix and the, you know, HBO and some of these things. These people are, are into the creative shit. And so that's why everybody's watching Showtime. Everybody's watching HBO because they're, it's not that the language is that or the, the material is that edgy. It's just that there's great shit, man. Subscriber based is is how is is where the safety net comes in. The fact that they don't have to report to any yeah. specific, they don't have to report to somebody who gets angry uh, because they did, were offended by something, and they call McDonald's and tell McDonald's to stop advertising on there, which shuts down a show. HBO, Showtime, Netflix, Amazon. They don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But see, I think that's I think that's a crock of shit too, because I think any time McDonald's pulls out, Burger King will come in. And I think any time that there's things that they're, they say they're yeah. threatened by, it's just a way to censor. It's just the right, it, and I hate to say this, but it's just that kind of scared right wing shit that's still that's still out there. You know, they call Hollywood real left left. You know, we're all we're all the way to the left, and we we're, well, we, sh- we should be because otherwise you wouldn't get creative stuff. Otherwise, you would yeah. just be catering to a very specific audience. You should be catering to everything and see yeah. what happens. But I think you do. I think you still have a little bit of that to the right. You know, the safety, the Christian. Let's put it that way: the Christian coalition. Of, of stuff that still is still kind of like trying to censor stuff down and yeah, it's called turn off the television yeah it's changed it we'll <laughs> we'll put it on after nine o'clock i mean you know whatever yeah but no, it, just turn off the tv yeah change the channel be if you're worried about what your kids watch i have a couple of them you know how you handle it don't watch they it. don't watch it yeah i mean it's it's so funny i mean i remember i was talking to somebody the other night we were talking about um was saturday night live because i remember when i was a kid watching saturday night live the original with the yeah. original cast and they go, was it really that funny? And I go, I don't know that it was necessarily as funny as Eddie Murphy and Billy Crystal and, and that kind of comedy, comedy stuff. But it was so fucking edgy at yes. the time. And it was shit. They were doing shit nobody was doing. It was a, it was a fascination to watch what was going on. Oh, my there, God. Yeah. I mean, yes, they were coked out of their minds yeah. and were doing <laughs> insane stuff. But they were still like, they were still amazing. Like, it was still like, how cutting edge was it? There was nothing even remotely close to that at the time. Because you only had three networks. Yeah. You know, you yeah. didn't have four networks. You had three. And after, at that point, nothing was on. Like, when Saturday Night Live was on oh, no. at that time yeah. at night, there was no other channel had anything on. It was oh, no. Like, I mean, you're watching you, that or you're not watching TV. Yeah, you're a teenager. You get to stay up late on Saturday night and you get to watch Saturday Night Live and you watch Belushi as the samurai <laughs> and you watch, you know, Father Guido Sarducci, Dude. who you just knew had weed. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it was just like, that was the coolest fucking thing ever at the time. But we don't, I don't think we have that anymore. I don't think there's, I don't think we've, I think there's so much of the internet has ruined all that. So there's not going to really be, other than maybe two clowns fucking on a high wire, you know, uh, during pay-per-view, you know, trying to get pregnant and have triplets. I mean, how, you know, where do you go? Well, Mike Tyson and Ronda Rousey beat each other. Yeah, senseless. exactly. Well, this is a little bit of a transition. I mean, this was the argument when I, because uh, I want to get into you doing uh, when you chose to do stand up. And, and, and the thing is, as we all know in this room, we, we can't pretend like we don't know this, but what the improv was in the 90s is not what the improv is now. And everybody talked about when it went corporate. Where you could no longer just walk into a room and, you know, the guy that was working the door, you know, yeah. working the room, you could, you, could, you could work that guy and you can get on stage and all that stuff. It became a corporate entity and started <clears throat> branching out and becoming, you know, uh, McDonald's, if you will, or Starbucks were sort of yeah. opening up in other cities. And it changed. And they said that that kind of changed the face of stand-up when stand-up became corporate as well. I mean, so it's like you see it everywhere, like what you're talking about. Everything just kind of becomes this corporate, a little bit safer, a little bit only book these comedians to do this stuff, to entertain to this audience. It's the and same comedians. Stop taking chances. It's the same comedians every, every night. It's the same comedian. If you, go, if you go out in Hollywood, for the most part, for the most part, <clears throat> You've got Chris D'Elia, Chris D'Elia, Chris D'Elia, you know, because he's the hot. And I love Chris D'Elia. It's not, I'm not. I'm it not, has nothing to do with him. It's, it's it's you're a comedian. Do, you take any gig they give you. Yeah, it's, it has nothing to do with him. It, it's like, you know, you've got, you know, you've got this guy at, the, you know, you know, Maz Jabrani's always at the Laugh Factory. Um, you've got, you yeah. know, it's just, it's the, the same guys. It's just, it, and, and I don't understand how. I, I, it's weird to me. It's like in the comedy store, you never used to be like that. And now the comedy store is like that. Yeah. Um, the comedy stores, you know, there's still, there still is that clubhouse to it. I mean, you know, I got to give Adam, Adam, you get credit for, you know, taking over a position that was basically run by a racist, you know, 
fucking insane dude. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it was it's a, one way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's dead the on. milder way of putting <laughs> it. Yeah. That's the nice way to put it. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, at the same time, though, you know, he was trying, even in his own disgusting mind, was trying to follow Mitzi's, what Mitzi wanted, you know, and that was that it didn't matter how big you were. You were still, that, that place was a gym. It was where you worked out. And I don't think any other room was like that at the time. You know, it's that, the, then again, there was nobody there in the gym. Right. So, <laughs> you know, you could work out all you wanted. There was nobody in the audience. It smelled like a gym. <laughs> yeah. But now, I mean, now it's packed again. It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely the hottest club in town by far. And I mean, and you've got people coming in that didn't used to come in. And, um, but I agree with you. I think there's just something about stand up. You know, because I met you when I first started. I remember I, because I, I was, it was like 2000, I got sober, what, you know, to, to be honest with you. I, I had a little bit of a problem for a, for a very long time. And, um, and then I cleaned up my act and I always wanted to do stand up from the time I was in college. I'd always wanted to do stand up. And, um, and then someone told me about Adam Barnhart. And I always didn't know, like, <clears throat> and to this day, if anybody says, "How do you, who's the good stand-up teacher? And it's like, nobody really can teach stand-up. No. But Adam Barnhart is the best fucking guy to get you at least started in the right direction. I think he, because he doesn't try to teach you a quote-unquote technique. He just tries to teach you how to get out of the way of yourself and be yourself. And I thought that was really cool. And then, you know, and then you would go to his class, and I did his class, and then you'd showcase it at the comedy store, and of course it was all dick and tit jokes. You know, it was <laughs> well, just yeah. At the you time, you talk about what you know, well, and you were probably he clearly knows about that. Well, prob- not the dick stuff, but you know a lot. Well, you know a lot how of use sex. it and use it. Yeah, you were. Yeah. yeah, but that's. I mean, any. I, it's so funny because like I just I think about the first things I talked about. And it was like it was so bad. But yeah. you wanted to I find a way to make it work. Laugh. Yeah, that's the thing about comedy is like it's an evolution, right? Yeah, if you absolutely. so choose for it to be, yeah. your first job when you when you do stand up is just figure out how to make somebody laugh on yeah. this weird stage that you're standing yeah, exactly, on. Exactly. That's exactly. it. We should never judge ourselves too harshly on the material we started with. Well, you were always a guy I really looked up to because I always I remember when I was going in there and then I got to be on the Sunday night regulars. So it's like, would you basically, I was the one who would put the candles on the table <laughs> to, and to get like four minutes. You know, I mean, it's like on Sunday nights and there was me and Lisa Joffrey and Melanie Vesey. But there was you and Brian Keith Etheridge were like the fucking dudes, man. They were the guys that came in and had like <laughs> 20 minutes of fucking, you know, rock and material. And I always looked up to you. I always thought you were, I always thought like, what a great comic. And, um, and I always admired you because you, I really, I thought you were, you know, I still do. But I mean, I'm saying, but especially at that time, I was like, holy shit, this guy's really, that's like the way I want to be able to be. And, um, and it was great at that time too, because the comedy store wasn't that busy. It wasn't that crazy. It was the Wild West. It was the Wild West. And, um, you know, I, I was getting, you know, you got in the comedy store. If you were Sunday night, we did Adam's Sunday night room. And you get in, so you got to do, I was there every Sunday night for th- almost three years, you know. And I think, you know, two years in, you know, I think um, I finally got to showcase for Mitzi. You know, didn't get even close to even her, even like even looking up from her popcorn, you know. Well, here's the thing about the showcase. Have you ever showcased there? I have. So you always hear the shit, but right? Not for you. Do you remember the first? So you remember the first time you showcase? Oh God, yeah. So they they all tell you like you better watch out because comics try to get in her ear and get her distract her from yep. watching the comedians. There was like this whole thing. Oh fuck yeah! You dude. get this whole thing. They tell you before you go on stage, <clears> but the, but what you realize after you go through it is in the end, it doesn't fucking matter. I mean, you could crush it and not become a regular, and 100%. you could eat ass and be get the call the next day congratulations you're in you just really didn't know as long as the, the key was though and there was some truth in the fact if she didn't want you you're, you were fucked yeah she didn't want you were fucked but it, the cool thing was too is it's like you um it back then mitzi would come in every sunday and every monday night no matter what she would sit in the back in that chair have a glass of wine and popcorn and she would have a showcase list her list of showcases and uh, Duncan Trussell was like the booker. You know, he was like, not the booker, but he was the... He He's ran, kind of the talent guy. He was yeah, the he talent ran, guy. Yeah. He was more or less the talent guy. He did Which the Which is weird to think of that now. I forget yeah. that he I, was I, that I, Duncan. That's when I first started, like, kind of poking my head in there. Yeah. He was nice. Uh, he was always fair to always everybody. Always the greatest guy, man. The, the sweetest guy in the world. And Duncan used to... Um, Duncan would help me out, and he would go... He'd try to get me in every six months or so. And I remember I, second time, nothing, you know. And then the third time I finally went up for... Um, 
Luca Polanka. Remember Luca? Yes. Luca is now married to Tammy Pescatelli. Fucking sweetheart. I knew Luca forever. And uh, Luca goes, don't worry, I got your back. So he's like making sure nobody got in her fucking ear. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember seeing him pushing, and I won't say what comic it was, you bastard. Um, <laughs> pushing the comic away because no comic wants you to get past. No. Right. They don't want you, you to get past. It's that's, real that's estate, less man. stage time for yeah, them. Right. stage time for them. And so... Um, and the thing was, is I knew I wasn't ready to like, I mean, I was still, I was still very new. I'd only been doing comedy about two years, maybe two and a half years, but I had done so much theater and done so much stuff. I was very comfortable on stage. Yeah. Like I didn't have you any had the problem performing being, part kind of I didn't of have down. that stuff done. I just didn't have the material. Like it wasn't like ironed out. But, um, so I went up and I did fairly clean stuff for her, talked about my family and stuff. And, uh, I remember walking off stage and she looked at me, she goes, you want to get some spats <laughs> and and i'm telling you this is like if you're a comedian and mitzi shore passes you it's like don corleone it's, it's just like don corleone going you know like just like fucking tapping you on the head you walk you walk down through the you walk down the three steps and then you're high-fiving your fucking way through the hallway just fucking you're just it's like you just won the super bowl or you just you're holding the stanley cup <laughs> yeah and i remember i got passed and then I called in, and I got uh, I got a spot at nine o'clock on like Wednesday night to open the show. And I didn't get a spot for six months after that. That's what she would do. That sounds about right. Yeah, because what she'd do is is you could work out on Sunday and Monday now. You were paid regular, so she would want to see if you wanted it, if you were going to work on it. Because she she told me afterwards later that night she said she goes you're not ready but at least now you have a place to work out and you have a stage to work out on. You need to work on your material. And so she wanted to see if you wanted it. So when you'd go in on Sundays and Mondays now, and you, the potluck would, the potluck and, the, and all the other stuff would be all the, the new stuff, and the, the employees was over at 9.30. Okay. So, so the lights went off. The 9.30, <clears throat> that was it. 9.30, that was done. And then there were showcases till 10 o'clock, if there were showcases. But Mitzi was there at 9.30. She would catch the tail end of the employees, and most employees didn't want to go up at that point. Because Mitzi was there, none of the paid regulars would I go. I forgot up. about it. It's so funny that they employees would were fucking scared to go run. Up they would sh- They would scatter because she would leave about ten fifteen, so she would be in there. So that I mean, literally, Tommy, who was not the booker, but he was working the cover booth. He was basically this is when he first started stealing. So Tommy <laughs> would be at the front, and Tommy would like go out and he would look for somebody to do a spot. And the paid regulars would, as soon as they saw Tommy, they would go to the front. Well, sure, they were afraid that she was going to hate them all of a sudden and unpaid regular them. Unpa- yeah, and and get I or, got kicked or, out. Yeah, get banned. I didn't even or, do anything wrong. Yeah, and it's crazy. But if you were new, you could go fuck. I'll go up because you had nothing to lose. Right. And she might hate you that night. She usually did. She never liked you. She never she would never go good job ever. Wow. Never would she say that. Nurturing. The bar is very high for the people that started there. So it's yeah. like you kind of always know that But you could go up every Sunday and Monday. Yeah, you that's could go up matter. and do 10 minutes every Sunday and Monday and you're like, "Holy shit." You know, and then back then there were so, so many rooms around too. You could go do spots at Westwood, you could do do all these other things. Bruco. <clears throat> yeah. So it was always it was always fun, but that was one of the great. Getting passed by her was a huge deal. So you had been working. At, you moved out here in '84. When did you actually first take the stage in stand up? When you said, "Fuck it, I'm going to do stand up." 2002. 2002. So almost 20 years in, you're like finally thinking to yourself, "All right, I got to do this." And what was the bug that after 20 years you finally decided? I don't to know. Do it? I just I, well, you said it was you got you got clean. Well, I mean, was, is that was there a tie to that, to that or it has nothing to do with it? Was that, yeah, a little bit. It was like I because I was always I mean I was a mess from like 92, 92 to 2001. It was pretty. Those are the dark days. It was dark. Court McCown, it was okay, dark. Yeah. It was it was not it was not a pretty. It was not pretty. I had moved to New York for a year, you know, a year okay. and a half, two years. And um, and I just, you know, it was just like... Were you working a lot in that time? No, no, not... Do you think that for, had a lot to do with it? A lot, no, no, no. I don't think oh. if I'd have been... If I would have if I would have worked more, I'd probably be dead. Because you'd have more <laughs> money, yeah. Well, I had... I was okay on money, and I was... It wasn't money wasn't the issue, because they had all kinds of weird jobs, you know. But at the same time, though, if I'd had more money, I would have probably been dead. But yeah. it, was, it was good that I didn't have enough. Um, yeah. I always say that about my 20s and moving out here. Like, if I would have gotten famous right away or gotten a bunch of money right away. I'd be talking to two dead guys. Easily. Yeah, yeah easily but it'd be the weirdest dead. show on you know, podcasting. But, but the weird thing was, is I was never one of those guys that got work and was like, oh, I'm cool. Like, I always kind of thought it was like such a privilege to get the jobs and get work. I was never a dick. 
I, I knock on wood. I hope I was never addicted. No, to and I can attest to that because ever since the day that I've met you, you've been nothing. You always have a smile on your face. You're not the guy that I ever pegged to be the angry douchebag. Right. You were always very, um, very, very pleasant to meet and talk to, and you were, you handled yourself that way with everybody. And I can say that because I always thought you were cool because you rolled up on a fucking motorcycle, and I always thought that was fucking cool. I, that's because of gas prices. That's why <laughs> I do that. I, 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 my, uh, my other car is a big clunker. Uh, you know, an old, I have an old fat Mercedes, you know, because they're cheap and they run forever. Right. Yeah, they run forever. But, exactly. but they just suck gas. So, um, yeah, I, I ride my motorcycle as much as I possibly can, you know. So first, is first time on stage, where was it? And do you remember um, first what it was time, like, what the feeling was? First time in the comedy store, in the that belly was the first, room. So the first time you ever went up was the belly room in the comedy store. Belly room at the comedy store. And I, I think nervous. I mean, I definitely was nervous. I mean, I don't think I was afraid, you know, it wasn't that. It was like... I think I was nervous because I was so used to doing theater. Um, I had done theater so many, I'd done so much theater. And um, I really, like theater's like you kind of memorize somebody else's stuff. And so there's like the emotions kind of written in, or you create the emotion that's, you know, through that thing. But I think with stand up, it's like, I didn't want to, I didn't, you know, I was learning from Adam at the time, and it was like, and you don't really, you, nothing's planned. It's like, you know, you know what your jokes are, you know what your stuff is, but you're not going to, you, it's not going to be, it's going to be this way. What's, you you know? remember the first thing you said when you got on stage, the first uh, joke? Um, I don't. Do you remember Forget a Laugh? I, th I think I did okay. You did okay. I did okay. You know, luck. Now, I always said that the first time you go up on stage is not the, is not the time that you usually say, I belong here. It's usually the second or third time you go up because then you kind of start to see who you really are and whether you want to be up there or not. But what was it for you? When did you finally, after doing it the first time, a couple times, when did you go, you know what, I'm going to, because again, you have to keep doing stand up. Yeah. This is not a once in a, every yeah. once in a while thing. The I commitment think, yeah, I is think real. I think it was, it took me a while. It took me a while. You weren't I was, sure. I wasn't. I wasn't not being sure. It's just that I had done, I had done so much stuff in like like I had done plays in theater where we would run for six months, you know, and I would work with these guys, that amazing, ta you know, stuff. And so I kind of like had a bar set really high. Like I need to have, you know, for for me to like say this is I'm good at this. Probably took a few years, you know, to be honest with you. I mean, I had good sets in there. I had some really, I'll never, never forget, I was with this, I had been doing stand-up about a year, maybe not even a year, and I was going to a Super Bowl party, I was going to the Super Bowl, and with the owner of the Indianapolis Colts. Of course. Sure. And so we were, Makes we, sense. We, were, we played golf together, we were good okay. friends, and so. <laughs> Jim Irsay? Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so we're going down, we're going down to San Diego, and we're staying at this, like, this, this little, this resort, whatever, and before we'd gone down, he goes, he goes, I've hired this guy to do stand up. And I go, oh, he's like, cool. He goes, so you're doing stand up now. And I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, he goes, well, why don't you, why don't you open for him? Oh my and God. I was like, I, I was thinking Super Bowl party. This is like, this could be my crowd, like uh, drunk, you know, yeah, drinkers, no, you know, no. this would be fucking awesome. <laughs> you why know? am I already getting anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. Here. yeah. And so, and so <laughs> as we're, as we're going there, as I'm, I'm going, oh, this is great, man. This is so fun. When we get there, we're down there and, um, and I, I guess it was about an hour or an hour and a half before the dinner that night. And he goes, uh, he goes, are you ready? And I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, all right, man. He goes, the kids are going to love this. And I go, w excuse me. And he had Sinbad was the, the comedian. Oh he'd my hired. God. He'd hired Sinbad as the comedian. And he's done this for years. He hires comedians for the, but it's the Indianapolis Colts. Super Bowl party. So, I mean, they're not in the, they're not in the Super Bowl, but they always, but all the family, it's Peyton Manning. It's like, I mean, his wife and his kids. It's a, it's a family. It's, it's not a adults. family. There's everybody, There's all adults ages. and a lot of kids and a lot of ages. Oh, no. And I, and I was like, dude, have you seen my act? It's all tit and dick jokes. And it's like, he goes, oh, you can't do those. <laughs> and I was like, well, fuck. I go, I got that nothing. That gives I me go, one minute of material. Yeah, I go, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do it. He goes, oh, fuck, yes, you are. I put your fucking name on the thing. You're going up. And I had this table, like, it, it was, I ate the <laughs> biggest bowl of shit. Like, I ate so much shit. I mean, just blank faces. Except for like my friends that were sitting at a table. <laughs> Who were laughing at you and not with you. Laughing at me, watching me eat shit the entire fucking time. <sighs> and I mean, I sweated my ass off. 
And um, what did Irsay yeah. have to say when you got off stage? He laughed his ass off because he knew you think, how uncomfortable you were. Well, I think he was just like he's such a sweet guy. He was just like, "Good try, buddy." <laughs> <laughs> he got buddied. Good try, though. That's yeah. yeah. Sucks. Oh, he, I mean, it was shit. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> but luckily, I mean, luckily, I mean, you cut to 13, 12 years later, twelve years later, and I just had I was headlining uh, Crackers in Indianapolis. Nice. And him and him and his girl came out and watched it, and I fucking destroyed that room. Redemption, that baby. It was redemption, and he was like, oh, because that's all he remembered. Of course. That's no matter how much you can put online and tell him that you've done, he's going to remember that time you <laughs> ate your time. own dick in front of <laughs> yeah. a children's party, oh, essentially. I ate my dick and jacked off and yeah. ate somebody <laughs> else's dick. Yeah, everyone I mean, was like, way too many dicks being jacked yeah. off and eaten. Oh, it was so bad. But to, see, but to have him come and see that show... Where it was like, I mean, it was like one of the, you know, solid. solid you walked 50, away going, oh yeah, hey, solid yeah. fifty minutes. Like, thank you, you know, yeah. and it was good. So it was good to have that redemption. But it did take about twelve years. Do you classify that as your worst gig? I mean, per, uh, for personally, I mean, and we all have crappy gigs, but we, like personally, for you, were you just like, oh my god, I, I is that, that the that, one that sticks in your memory? That was the biggest bowl of shit I ever ate. <laughs> I think the worst gig I ever did was me and this guy Paul Hughes. Paul Hughes and I were, got asked to do a Sunset Junction Music Festival. Oh. And we thought there, we thought we were going to go up and do stand-up before, like the two of us, we each of us go up and do like 10 minutes. And we get there, and they go, no, we want you guys to do like a little buddy-buddy, like, you know, to, you know, kind of like the Sklar Brothers or, you know, but whatever. why? Buddy-buddy. Yeah. You've never, have you done, have you never, sold ever Did they give you guys that? one shirt to wear? Yeah, exactly. And I'll it take was the like, right arm. And we have to split the check. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck it was. And it was like so, and we, and we were opening for Phoebe Snow. Who's like this old the old lesbian, you know? Who sing, you know? She's like Poetry Man is her favorite favorite song or famous song, and so we're in front of like these butch dykes, yeah, you know, at outdoors, in Silver Lake, outdoors at dusk, and they're just screaming, "Take your shirt off, take your shirt off, pussy," <laughs> you know. And so what I did was I just finally got I talked my buddy Paul into going down and taking a picture and they just ripped him apart. <laughs> like they just like basically did it and I just made fun of them. <laughs> I mean that was the worst gig. That is that by far the worst gig. Best and gig? Li- and literally they hated us. Like they hated us. But what a weird like who's booking that? Someone who has no idea. Dude, come like, on. You, you, yes. My, you, oh really? You think there's other people that book comedy and have no idea what they're doing? Yeah, that happens so all the insane. time. insane. Like all oh, these people are definitely going to love a stand up. Like I what? did I did a gig once. You, you always get asked to do these parties sometimes. Like I did a corporate thing and I got I did a corporate thing for a golf course and I just did my stand up and they loved it. They nice. like they were they were really cool. Like they were really it took a minute but they were really cool. And then, um, and then they, the same guy that booked that asked me to do a thing for the uh, USC football team. They were, get, they were getting ready to play in the Rose Bowl. And so they would have like this dinner, uh, mandatory. By the way, they had to be at this dinner at the hotel. And so there, they show up in sweatpants and everything. And there's like music. And it's kind of a, a you know, f- whatever kind of fiesta thing going on. And they're like, and then all of a sudden, like, oh, and yeah, we got a comedian for you here. And they just hand you here. the mic. That's your intro. Here's, oh, I love the here's. Here's your intro. Here. Yeah. And all they really, all the guys, Mark Sanchez was there, Pete Carroll. It was like, it was back then. And, wow. and all they really want you to do is, is make fun of yes, the guys. Yeah. They, want yeah. You to they just, just want you to make fun of these guys. And then when you do make fun of them, then they, it's young guys, then their feelings get hurt. <laughs> and so, and these are big fucking guys. Dude, dude football players. Yeah, yeah. Football players. So I started fucking. <laughs> with this I like this one guy started you know kind of heckling me a little bit and I was like and I really fucking went at him and uh and then he got like pissed man <laughs> but I you know because he kind of said some stuff and I and then I you know he started on my family and then I really went at his family ah and I guess he had some problems with his family <laughs> and, <laughs> that's weird and then and Mark Sanchez basically had to stop it you know and so he goes no no make fun of me make fun of me and I was like oh the Mexican you know <laughs> <laughs> And and it was like and then at the end Pete Carroll comes over to me and he goes, "What a great job, dude!" He goes, "I don't know how you made it through that." You know, he was like he was a nice guy. Wow, but, yeah, wow, so, you survived. Yeah, that's some of the stories that always happen. We uh, we're running a little short on time, so I actually just want to talk about um, you've been you've been cranking out the comedy for years, and you actually do. Um, 
You put out a. I don't. What do we call them now? CDs. I, that's what albums? I was just going to say. We you, say everything's album? digital distribution. I like the kind. I think album is this we're, next guy we're put out an MP3. Like, what would you call it? You, I, I, I call it an album. You I, do yeah. you know, an eventually, album. it'll be pressed onto some vinyl. Even, are you if, gonna, are you even if, do it? Even if somebody just spits on a piece of vinyl, I don't know. <laughs> um, but no, um, yeah. I mean, it's an album. It's what I did was is I went down. I, I had recorded this, recorded my hour. Is this recorded an hour three times before? And I'd done it for eight years in, I did it, or seven years in, I did it like nine years in, and whatever, you know, I kind of, but it was never right. Like, I didn't, like, I wouldn't listen to it. So I'm like, fuck it, I'm not going to, because I see a lot of guys put out a, an album, and it's like, really, that's what you're going to put out there? That's what, because everyone's going to listen to this, and it doesn't go away. There's your benchmark. You know, yeah. so it's like, I mean, yeah, there's this shitty YouTube set you have up there, but so what, you know? But so finally, I just I went down to La Jolla Comedy Store, which is one of my favorite places in the world, and um, I did I did this hour over four nights, and I really only used one show. Okay. So it's and I I got this great recording engineer. It sounds freaking amazing, even though if you hate the jokes, the the, <laughs> the, the, the sound mixing, the sound is mixing beautiful. is fucking top shelf. I hear someone winning a Grammy. <laughs> yeah. What we did is we actually took the mics and we put the mics behind the stage, the audience mics. So you actually hear what, what it's you like. Hear. What it's like to be on stage oh, at a wow. comedy show. All right. So you actually get to hear what it's like to fucking murder a crowd. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, but but I I had such a great time doing it, and it was it was the stuff that I was done doing. It was all the material I was done with. Yeah. You know, and and I, I think that's what it should be. I think that's what, yeah. If and I think on a CD. It, yeah, and like, I think it and I think it's the material that evolved into what it evolved in. I'm you know like you know two years ago. I do a bit about going on a cruise ship. It, it was it was four minutes. Now it's eight minutes. Sure, you know it's like just all the things that I finally f like. Okay, that's as far as I can go with that. That's as far as I can go with that subject. And and I just I like it. I like the album. I think it's good. I think it's funny. Um, I've listened to it and actually gone, yeah. That's that that's that's a well that was a well crafted joke, you nice. know. Yeah. <laughs> that I spent you know after three hours with Al Madrigal at a coffee shop one day, <laughs> you know we figured that one out, you know, and um, and that's what we used to do. I mean, you know, as comics, you know that you sit down with guys and it's it's still your material, but you're you it's always good to like bounce it off people, and yeah. I mean that stuff had been, you know, eight years in the making. And most of the stuff is probably three years, three years old, you know, I mean, or two or three years old. But I mean, I, I like the album. I, I really do. I like the album. And, um, and I hope, you know, hope your listeners do. It's, 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 it's fun to put that out and go, yeah, I'm proud of this. What's it well, called? It's called Live from Pearl Street. Yeah. Which is where the La Jolla Comedy Store is located. It's on Pearl Street. So, and I thought it was so funny. I was talking to Tom Papa one night and I had some, I, I, I have a joke that I do that I talk about, and I don't mind, I can do the joke here, it's no big deal, it's not going to rain the album, it's only a 30 second joke, but <laughs> I talk about like Instagram, you know, and, I say, and at the end of the thing I say, you know, you'll never see the Dalai Lama post a selfie with his back arched, his ball sack hanging out, hashtag blessed, you know, <laughs> and so I was going to call the album hashtag blessed, and, uh, and I was telling Tom Papa this, and he, and he goes, no, that's just, that's, that's not good, that's, that, that's, it sounds like some Christian album. And I was like, I go, what do you want me to call it? Live from Pearl Street? And he goes, ooh, that's a great name. <laughs> and so I just kind of was like, thanks, Tom Papa. You know, yeah. it came out. Um, I, I just, I love it. I, I did, I had a good friend in Vegas did the artwork for me. And, um, you know, I, uh, this guy, Mike Duncan, did the sounding, sound engineer. He's great. He's fucking phenomenal. It sounds great. Get, get get the goddamn get Just, the goddamn yeah. out. Go download it. It's only nine ninety nine. I mean, you spend that on coffee these days. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, you can John. spend more than that. I spend thirty dollars at Taco Bell for gas. Say fancy. This would be a good thing. You put you put your headphones on, do a round of golf, listen to uh, Live from Pearl Street. Yeah, it's this is a, this is a good ride home. This is a good ride home. And I had somebody that was really funny. Like you know, you get every now and then you get these Twitter messages from somebody, and they somebody downloaded the album. And the guy goes, you just told me about my, you just basically transcribed my first and second marriage. And I was like, oh, okay, good. Good to know. <laughs> Were you ever married? No. 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 Look at him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. You're him. like, you're He's still kept together. Still good looking. You got a tan. You like smile. You got. I'm happy. It's goddamn <laughs> Steve McQueen over there. What yeah, are you talking happy. about? You married. Yeah. yeah I, I, I want you though. I, I, it's going to happen. Yeah. Just not for a while. You there know? You There's nothing wrong with that. 
you know. Again, I can't stress enough. I have a, my, I'm not doing this because my wife doesn't listen, so I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything to get out of anything. Yeah. But I, I got it good. I made the right choices. You know, I I'd think... Be, I'd be a schlub. I mean, I you, you've always struck me as a very, very happy person, like a very even-keeled person. You don't walk up, you know... Oh, oh, what? No, no. I don't don't, 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 don't buy John. Maybe, don't buy maybe John in stuff. passing. Look, Brian's so happy, but deeper conversation reveals whatever man no that's true no you're you're a happy guy i mean you're not you're when you're when you when you get mad you're not mad at your situation in life or where you are in life or I'm mad at you or you're yeah, yeah you're probably mad at something i did yeah but i think that's like i mean you you know over the years we've still i mean we see each other and it's like yeah you're not somebody who walks up going like where's my where's my shit where's my shit and and that's and that's kind of hard to be around it's hard for me you know and and i kind of catch myself i have to catch myself and go you're where you're supposed to be. Just shut the fuck up and enjoy your life. Right. You, know? you know, I'm not young anymore. So, well, yeah. dude, you don't look old. I'll tell you that. You right. look, you look very in shape. Maybe it's the golfing. Maybe it's he will not marry you. Yeah, maybe you're not he's married. Not marry you, John. Yeah, no, no, he's not going to marry you. Please I, marry me. Yeah, I think it's the AIDS. <laughs> I don't know. I don't it's know. the AIDS <laughs> as you're real skinny. Yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. thank you so much. Live thank from you, Girl Street. Yeah, live Get from Girl Street. Pick it up. And your Twitter is uh, at Court McCowan. C O R T M C C O W N. Just like the football player. And you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna continue to be out and about uh, doing I the gigs, right? I'm at I I know I'm at the comedy store this weekend sometime. I, you know I you know I'm going to the new Ha Ha, great fucking club. Yeah, it is actually. It's a nice yeah, room. It's Things a nice are changing. Room. I yeah. hope that comedy has a boom, and I feel like it's coming. And I feel like actually social media, as much as we ragged on it earlier, I think is good for comedy. I think uh, this digital media is good for comedy. I think YouTube is good yeah. for stand up comedy. I think we're gonna see a lot of great stand up comedy coming our way. It's kind of what we talked about earlier. When it's good. It, sh- it it shows up somewhere. People find the good. They really do. Absolutely. Look at Sebastian Maniscalco. One of the so, funniest people. So in- fucking funny, dude. Never just- never done a TV show. Never done. Never been on any. You know. Never had any of that stuff. And it p- sells out theaters now. So I guess another nice standing, guy too. Another yeah. fucking great guy. I actually have never met him personally or talked to him because he intimidates the hell out of me for some reason. But he is. Uh, I, j- I keep watching. You should be embarrassed. Every time it comes on Showtime, I just watch it. It's it, his Chicago. He is like a guy I went to high school with who just makes me laugh because he's fucking points out everyone being douchebags. It's it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, I, I find him hilarious. All right, Court. Thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me, guys. All right. Thank you for listening to Hollywood Anonymous. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Hollywood Anani. That is short for Hollywood Anonymous. You can also follow John individually at John Huck and myself, Brian Irwin, at Brian Irwin on Twitter as well. Both of us can be found on Facebook. You can also Google us and contact us directly, HollywoodAnonymousGuys at gmail.com. Thank you again so much for listening, and please don't forget to subscribe 